last March when we had our cabaret night and agreed to do an El Frank on birthday party this evening, my first thought was, oh, if Michael, let us interview him. Michael, most of you, I assume, know well who he is, but for those of you who might not, Michael has literally spent a lifetime researching L. Frank Baum and Oz. Most of us who are familiar with his work know him through things he's published. The annotated Wizard of Oz being um, a, a particular milestone publication in Oz history. He has a W.W. Dinslow biography that most of us have tucked away in our collections. Hang on a minute, let me look at my shelf because I've got all of my Michael books right here. Um, he's done a wonderful catalog about uh, W.W. Dinslow also, the, the Critical Heritage Collection that he edited of essays about the Wizard of Oz. Um, the screenplay, he did the introduction to the MGM screenplay back in 1989. So there's just a whole, and, and then he does smaller pieces, um, but substantial ones. Of course, he's contributed to the Bomb Bugle regularly. There will be books like the Santori Illustrated Wizard of Oz for which he provided introduction. So you just find his research a lot. But beyond writing, uh, Michael has been a consultant to auction houses and collectors because he has probably seen more original handwritten L. Frank Baum documents than anyone and more original Dinslow and Neal artwork. So he's often sought out as an expert to authenticate those kind of materials. He uh, curated, he's curated multiple exhibits, but the one in particular that I got to go see was at the Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art, where for Baum's 150th, he assembled this extraordinary collection of original artwork from all sorts of different artists and contributors. It was uh, terrific. Then we all think of him as this Oz expert, but he has also annotated A Christmas Carol and Huckleberry Finn. He'll tell you, I'm sure, about what he's working on now. Uh, he's written a children's story, um, Victorian fairy tales. So, um, I'm really, the author of rare books <laughs> or secondhand books. So that is um, a bit about Michael and he and I have been friends for many years. I think we first met in 82 and we've spent time together at Oz Club conventions and here in Kansas City and in New York. And I'm just really excited that y'all could maybe get to know him a little bit better. I wanted to start by asking you, since you began studying L. Frank Baum 50 years ago, how did you even first get introduced to Oz? Why don't you start with that for us? I was playing with a whole bunch of kids and one of them had gotten a picture book of the Wizard of Oz, maybe the Anton Loeb edition or something like that. And the kids were all playing Wizard of Oz on roller skates. They all <laughs> pretended, I, I didn't know what they were doing, what was going on. But I became aware of this book called The Wizard of Oz because they were all, all playing, uh, you know, they pretending that they were the scarecrow to the little car they lie. And I didn't, know, I, I didn't know the story at that point. But it wasn't until uh, we moved to Southern California that I really became aware of it. My sister was the one who, my older sister was the one who discovered Oz before I did. And she brought the books home. I was too young to check them out of the library. You had to be, I don't know if you had to be eight or nine or something like that, but I must have been six or seven. And what fascinated me about the Oz books were the illustrations more than anything else. I mean, John Arneal's pictures. I, you know, I would make up stories looking at the pictures, thinking that the books would be about this and this. Of course they never were, but um, I sh it was really the illustrations that drew me to the books. And then The Wizard of Oz came on Christmas 1956, and it came on at about nine o'clock at night, and I fell asleep. But we did have the album, you know, the uh, of the um, you know taken directly from the from the film itself, and so I knew all the songs, I knew everything about it. But uh, but really, it was my sister who was the really the big Oz fan, and then then they created this uh, Frankenstein. How did you, tell us about your approach to research. Well, um, when I was doing Annotated Wizard of Oz, I realized or very quickly when I started looking into some of the, the 
main sources, uh, primary sources, that so much that had been published on The Wizard of Oz just wasn't true. It just, you know, on, on Baum and on, on The Wizard of Oz just was not true. And so uh, I also, uh, when I was a freshman at Hamilton College, I took a writing course from Alex Haley, who was talking about, you know, all he was talking about was this guy, Kunta Kinte and Kizzy, you know, that means stay put. And later it was pub he published a book called Roots, you might have heard of. And he was my first writing teacher, and he really was my first mentor. And he emphasized that not to trust anything that was published. If you were doing original research, you go to public records, you interview people, you go to the place where these things took place, you, you did original research. You didn't just regurgitate what other people had published on, on your subject. And it was, it was primarily through him that I learned how to, how to do research, you know, original research. Uh, and I learned a lot from Martin Gardner, who was also a mentor of mine. And he gave me all kinds of, of, uh, of hints on how, how to find things. For example, uh, if you wanted to know more about a certain person who knew L. Frank Baum or knew the family or some, had some connection to him, look at the obit and look at who, the, who their children are, contact the children. That's how I, I met Frederick Richardson's son. Um, I can't remember everybody else I was in touch with, but when I did the work on Denslow and on Baum, on Neil, I was in touch with all these people who, if they did not know Baum directly, they certainly knew him. Uh, uh, they, their parents certainly knew them. Who were some of those key people that you interviewed who helped you research when you were back at Annotated? I know you mentioned Matilda Jewell to me. Well, right? she was she was the most important one because she was she she sent me a fan letter when Annotated Wizard of Oz came out. She must have been about ninety years old, and uh, she sent it to me. And uh, I, you know, I, she said, you have to come and, and, and I'll tell you about Frank, you have to come out to Aberdeen, South Dakota, and I'll show you some things that I have. Well, um, I wasn't sure how, how I was able to, going to be able to pull that off, but I happened to be in California and I was interviewing Ozma Baum, L. Frank Baum's granddaughter, Ozma Baum Mantel. And she said, you know, you should really meet this person named Sally Rush Wagner, who's doing a biography of Matilda uh, Jocelyn Gage. And I said, oh, I'd love to meet her. And then the next week, Sally met with Ozma and she said, you know, you should really meet this guy, Michael Patrick Hearn, who's doing the biography of L. Frank Baum. And it was through Ozma that we finally got together. And it was through Sally Rush Wagner that uh, I finally did meet Matilda. We made arrangement to meet in Aberdeen. We went, Matilda was still living at home at the time. And I don't know, we went through everything, her, her, her library, her um her 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 attic her garage her basement we were finding stuff constantly i remember i went down to the basement and i i just saw in in one of the vestibules a um it looked like a scrapbook and i opened it up and it was all these these postcards uh picture postcards of italy and egypt and i took one out and i looked on the back and it was in maud's hand this was a scrapbook that was filled with postcards that Maud had sent the gauges when they were traveling in Europe. So I had, you know, that, that was, Matilda had, had, must have forgotten it. Sally wasn't aware of it. We, we, you know, we added it to, you know, Mat Matilda's treasures because as far as I know, that's the only, probably the only weekly uh, record of what they did in, 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 uh, during their, their trip in 1906 to Egypt and then to Europe. Um, and, you know, she had, Sally told me the story that, uh, Ma, Ma, that Matilda found some old letters from Maud that were in the, in, in her garage, up in the attic in the garage, and, and Sally was going through them and, and showed them to them, she said, oh, just throw those out, nobody's going to be interested in them, and Sally said to her, well, there will be somebody eventually who'll be interested in it, and of course it was me, and what's important about these letters is that, you know, they're not by L. Frank Baum. They're from, from Maud to Matilda uh, in, in the last months of L. Frank Baum's life. And it's the only record we have of a, uh, the weekly record of 
Baum's health failing, the fail failing of his health right before he died. So we really have a picture of what he was going through during those last months of his of his life. Now, Matilda lived with them, didn't she, or visited them frequently? We're talking Matilda Jewell. For those yes. who, are, who might not be following, Matilda Gay, not- This is Matilda Jewell Gage, who's L. Frank Baum's niece, but Matilda Jocelyn Gage's granddaughter. And she lived in Aberdeen, South Dakota, most of her life. Not every, you know, she lived most of her life there. She was born in Aberdeen and died in Aberdeen. And she knew the bombs incredibly well. She had an extraordinary memory. And she was someone who didn't embellish. If you asked her something, no, that didn't happen. This is what happened. And she would, she could pinpoint things so well. I remember we borrowed some of her photographs and um, we blew them up because you know, some of them were you know, small and then you know, I, I did them as eight by tens and Sally and I showed them to her. And I remember one, it was the interior of the sign of the goose and she said, well, there's Rob's mandolin and there's the goose headed na nails on the, on, on the table there. And there's something, you know, she would point out everything that was in, in the picture. And, you know, it, it, we did that with a lot of photographs and she would identify the different people which we wouldn't know otherwise because they weren't identified on, on the back. And this is something very important. Identify people on the back of your photographs because it can be very confusing. But Matilda had in, you know, vivid, vivid memory. And she knew the bombs when they first moved out there in 1888 to, she was two years old when they moved out there, but she could still remember things during that period. For example, she said that she once stayed with the bombs overnight and and she said, well, I slept on half a gump. In other words, it was one. It was a couch that she re referred to as half a gump. And oh, what else? She she said that she remembered the the bomb boys each had a Christmas tree one year, and uh, and she visited the bombs in Chicago. She went to school at Northwestern and she would say she went to see the bombs every weekend until her mother finally said, you've got to meet some of your classmates. You can't be seeing Uncle Frank and Aunt Maude all the time. So she had lots of memories about uh, visiting the bombs. Uh, and then uh, in 1915, uh, she and her parents went out to uh, Hollywood and they stayed with Maude and they were there for several months. So she had some very vivid recollections that we would not have otherwise if it were not for Matilda. Mm -hmm. What I love about you as a researcher is Matilda hasn't been with us now for 20 years and no one can interview her now. I mean, you did it when she was available and I just see a lot of your research as being you being able to speak one-on-one -on -one with people who knew Baum personally or who were involved much earlier than most of us today. Um, well, I, jo I joined the Oz Club when I was 10 and I started you know, I, I start writing to people. I mean, I, I joined the Oz Club I, I, in 1960. Uh, Dick Martin's edition of Visitors from Oz came out, and I sent him a fan letter, and he wrote back to me, and he illustrated it. I thought, oh my God, maybe every every letter he'll send me will have a picture on it, have original picture on it, and uh, I wrote back to him, and then. He sent me a second letter, but then the third letter, he had had enough of me and he passed it on to Fred Meyer. But he told me about this club, the International Wizard of Oz Club and gave me Justin Schiller's address. And I joined the club when I was 10 years old. And I've known these people, you know, 60 years now. Were there other Bond family members? You've mentioned Ozma and Matilda that you have interviewed? Well, I interviewed almost all of his grandchildren. Uh, the ones that were still living. There was Josh Baum, who was Frank J's son. His brother was no longer living. Uh, um, Robert Baum, who was, of course, Robert's son. Um, oh, I'm trying to think who. who There's who Cynthia else. in. in who, um, well, Cynthia was a niece. a niece. She was Baum's brother's daughter in Syracuse. And she had never spoken to anybody before until I located her. And she, she was living in uh, outside of, of New York City before moving up. She eventually moved up to Chittenango. But um, she would not talk. She had not spoken to anyone until she spoke to me. 
And uh, it was it was quite a testy, let's say, testy interview. A number of times she said, turn that off, turn off that recorder. <laughs> uh, but we eventually got to be great, great friends. And uh, but that that first interview was was quite a little adventure. And uh, let's see who else. Of course, it's uh, Robert Baum, Osmond's cousin. Uh, what was it? he was he was also <laughs> A character too, but uh, he was very generous to me in, in the long run. Josh was too. Josh allowed me to copy anything that he had, and he also arranged to photograph some you know, family uh, treasures for me. Um, let's see who else in the family. Uh, of course, Bob Baum. He had inherited um, his his grandmother's collection, so he he has an incredible uh, Baum collection. He's also a wonder, you know, wonderful guy. I'm trying to think who else. Uh, well, you know, I also interviewed uh, Gloria uh, Gottschalk Morgan, who was uh, um, Gottschalk's daughter, and she was very, very. She and I also interviewed um, uh, H. M. Haldeman's daughter, Dorothy, by coincidence. And when I went there, I, I said, you know, I just flew in from Washington D.C. I was staying. I was at my parents before I went out to Los Angeles, and she said, oh. You're from Washington, D.C. Well, you must know my, my nephew, Bob. And she pointed to a picture on the wall of Richard Nixon with H.R. Haldeman, who was her nephew. Uh, I mean, there's some, you know, some extraordinary things. And then there were, you know, I'm trying to think, who, uh, you know, I, I would talk, I'd be meeting somebody. And say, oh, you know, my mother knew L. Frank Baum. And, you know, I was at, at some cocktail party and she was there and I asked her what she remembered about him. She just remember he was just an incredibly nice guy. I interviewed Ramola Remus Dunlap, who was the first screen Dorothy and got her to come to one of the Oz conventions. And it, she, it was like, she was in a particularly rundown part of Chicago. But when you entered her apartment, it was like entering another era. It was like entering into the 1920s. And we would talk about Baum and she remembered him quite vividly, even though she was about seven years old at the time. And, and then suddenly she stopped, she said, I'm going to give you a treat. And she sat down at her piano and did her whole vaudeville routine for Sally and I. I mean, it was just, she was just, she, she was, she was quite something. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, Manola uh, was in the fairy locks, correct? Yes, she was in the uh, the radio play in Fairy Log, or Fairy Log and Radio Plays, back in 1908. Uh, but she she had, you know, she had a letter from Baum. She had some, she had a, a photograph during her vaudeville year. She was known as Baby Remus, and she was she was quite something. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Oh, uh, they're just you know, so many people. They were still around when I when I began this in the 1970s, 1980s. Now I met Margaret Hamilton in the theater. She was sitting in two rows in front of me. I was working at Annotated Wizard of Oz, and we had seen the Peter, we were watching the Peter Brook production of A Midsummer's Night's Dream, which was an enormous hit at the time. And we were all up in the orchestra. And I remember someone saying, Oh, that's not Margaret Hamilton. What's she doing up in these cheap seats? Well, she was. And I stopped her during the intermission and told her what I was doing. And she said, and I said may, may I interview, may I talk to you? She said, oh, sure, Derry. My, my number's in the phone book. And I called her up and uh, interviewed her for the book. And wh what's interesting, she was the first person, I think I was the first person to publish the fact that Victor Fleming did not, did not um, direct the entire production of The Wizard of Oz, because she had a copy of The Wizard of Oz that was signed by everyone, but Victor Fleming and Judy Garland asked her, why didn't Judy Garland sign it? This was Margaret Hamilton's own copy of The Wizard of Oz she had when she was a little girl. And I said, why isn't Judy here? Said, well, she was on, she was already promoting the film in New York. So this was when she and Mickey Rooney were sent to, to the, I think, Lowe's Theater mm -hmm. to promote the film. And, and, but there wasn't Victor Fleming said, well, how come um, King Vidor is here? And I of course knew his work, you know, through the big parade and, and um, the crowd. I was a great fan of his silent films. And she said, well, he, he, he did the Kansas sequences in the film. I said, what, what are you talking about? Yes, he did, he, he photographed all, he, he filmed the Kansas sequences, the ones in sepia. 
which I had never heard before. And then I published it in, I think it was the Bomb Bugle. And I think that's the first time it ever was, he was ever given credit for that. And I found out later that he refused to talk about it in any interviews or anything like that, as long as Fleming was alive. He did not want, you know, it be known publicly that uh, uh, he had worked on the film. He wanted, you know, the studio gave, only gave credit to Fleming and Vidor did not um, want to take any credit for the film. Well, uh, and I'm sorry, I should have realized that you'd be getting to Margaret because you and Margaret became dear friends. She was yeah. one of my best friends. Yeah, she was, she was, a lot, she was a lot of fun. Yeah, we, we, uh, <laughs> what was that? You brought her to an Oz Club convention. Or oh, two. yes, it was a Munchkin convention. Now that was, it was sort of a last minute thing because she was constantly being in and out of town, you know, doing this or doing that, uh, you know, appearing here or performing, you know, do, she was still doing a lot of television and film work. And I said, um, would you like to go to a Munchkin convention? And she said, well, what are all the little people having a convention for? I said, no, 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 not that kind of munchkin. This is from the Oz Club. And she said, oh, sure, dearie. And so we took the train down and we just showed up. I didn't, I, I, I didn't alert anyone, including Ray Powell, who was head of the, the convention. And I think he was a little nonplussed <laughs> because he already had his own plans. You know, you know, I just invited Maggie, not as a speaker, but just, you know, as, as, as my guest. And, and uh, I, Ray called her up to the front of the stage and he asked, you know, if anyone had any questions and he took one question because he had to deal, he had to go ahead with this Oz auction. So the whole day was an Oz auction <laughs> and Maggie wasn't interested in that. So we went to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie liked a good stiff one, I can tell you. And we had a great time just, you know, just chatting away. And 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 she actually did enjoy it. Uh, although she might have been disappointed that there were any little people there. Um, you told me once that when you had a launch party for Annotated Wizard. Oh, that was my book party, yes. I tell people about that. Well, it was sponsored by... Barbara Seaman and uh, Gideon Seaman, who were the parents of Noah Seaman, who some some people may know. He was an Oz Club member at the time. He was he was still in high school, and maybe he wasn't even in high school yet. But he was he was very involved in the Munchkins and and the Oz conventions, and he went every summer. And Barbara said, "Well, uh, we will we will have a book party here at my apartment on on uh, uh, on West End Avenue and." Um, she invited all these friends of hers. She was a feminist writer. So Erica Jong was there and all these other people. Um, uh, and she, she had read a little item in New York Times that these guys were working on a, a new musical, The Wizard of Oz. So she invited Ken Harper who produced The Wiz and Charlie Smalls who wrote the score. And they premiered the score at my book party. Now, had I invested in that show, I would be a wealthy man today. But uh, I, I later got to know Ken quite well. And he said that he got the idea for a black musical and all, you know, the Super Soul musical, The Wiz, by reading Martin Gardner's front page article in the New York Times, in the New York Times book review, that uh, where he mentioned that I was working on Annotated Wizard of Oz. And he, he said he was looking for he was, he was very, dis Ken was a, a DJ, a black DJ at the time, and he wanted to get into, into uh, play production. He wanted to bring something to Broadway. And he thought there was all this great black talent that was underutilized. And so he said, he thought, I'm going to create a black musical and I've got to find a subject. And he read Martin's article and said, ah, that's it. I mean, what's, what, what could be more American than The Wizard of Oz? And he went to the book, not to the movie. He was not he was not that crazy about the movie, but he went directly to the book and they created this fantastic uh, Broadway musical that won seven Tonys that year. And you also told me about one other celebrity mention of annotated Wizard of Oz recently. Look oh, at that. Are you talking about Diana Ross? Yes. Well, us. when Diana Ross did uh, The Wiz, it was quite controversial because people thought, what, what's this 36-year-old woman playing a little girl? Well, 
in, uh, to prepare for the role, Ken Harper gave her a copy of Annotated Wizard of Oz. And in her autobiography, she mentions Annotated Oz and, and justified her being her performing as Dorothy because Baum just calls her a girl. He doesn't say anything about her age. So he, well, he didn't really say she was a 24 year old a high school teacher or an elementary school teacher, but she used it as justification for her taking the role. Um, you mentioned Sally Wagner a bit earlier. What kind? Tell us a little bit about what you and Sally have have worked and discovered together. Well, what Sally did was she introduced me to the Gage side of the family. I knew the bomb side, so I introduced her to the bomb side of the family, and she introduced me to the Gage side. And as far as I knew at the time, most of the biographers of Baum were only interested in Baum. They weren't interested in the family. So they didn't really seek out any stories about Baum. They were interested in only, well, it has to be awful Aussie, Mr. Baum. You know, they were only interested in a very narrow part of his life. But when I decided, when I was doing Annotated Wizard of Oz, I decided it would be the whole phenomenon of Oz, not just the wizard. So it required my doing a lot of, a lot of primary research. And, and also trying to gather a lot of a lot of information that no one had even looked at before. And uh, when I was doing decide to do a new biography, uh, because as I was doing Ante Wizard of Oz, I realized that what Frank J. Baum did not know, he just made up into Please a Child. And I had a long, long discussion with uh, Russell McFall, who gave me the stamp of approval for doing a new book. He had always wanted to revise it to please a child, but it was it was too late by then. And uh, so, um, I, you know, I was in touch. With, so Sally put me in touch with the Gage side of the family. And there are all kinds of photographs, family photographs, photographs taken by L. Frank Baum that they had, uh, letters, uh, and letters not just from L. Frank Baum, but letters from Matilda Gage, from uh, Maud. Maud was, see, L. Frank Baum was not a great correspondent. But Maud and Matilda were, and their and their letters are full of gossip about the Baum family. Matilda spent her winters with the Baums in in her later years, so she she was a witness to what was going on in that household, and um, so you know Sally was very crucial in terms of, of of the biography, and also she she certainly schooled me on in on the importance of Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Super, as I'm looking at questions that I want to make sure I ask you. I wanted to ask about the Eric Carl exhibit in particular. You curated this incredible collection of original art. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you've come to be familiar with where these private art collections are and the, the contemporary illustrators who worked on Oz? Well, I, I, you know, I, I work for Cricket Magazine, so I met a lot of these artists along the way and got them to uh, contribute to to loan us material to the uh, uh, to the exhibit. But the majority of the work I knew in private collections, uh, most of these, th you know, mostly through the Oz Club. Uh, a lot of the members were Oz Club members who had collected, uh, particularly John Arneal and some Denslow as well. Of course, the New York Public Library in the um, prints and photographs department has a Prince of Drawings department has extraordinary uh, collection of the original drawings for the wonderful Wizard of Oz by Denslow. And we, we drew on that. I also contacted somebody who had, I think five, at least five original drawings, but she refused to loan them to me. So I, so I found somebody else. This is in private collection. Um, and of course, yeah. you know. Warhol's the witch. Oh yes, yes. That, that's a funny story. I don't know if people are familiar with Andy Warhol's picture of Margaret Hamilton as the Wicked Witch of the West. It's one of his, uh, uh, was it called um, Myths series, I think. And, you know, he had everything else, Santa Claus and Mickey Mouse and all those things. But he happened to run in, into Margaret Hamilton at, a, at, at some, some reception. And he asked her if she would pose for him. And she said, sure, sure, dearie. And the day that he had had arranged for her to be photographed. I happened to have already have an appointment with Maggie. We were going to go out to dinner that night. So she was telling me about what it was like to be photographed by Andy Warhol. And she said, oh, he had the, he had the hat and he had, a, had, had a, 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 some sort of a shirt or something. And, 
And so he, he, you know, do do this, do that. And he kept going, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Fab <laughs> <laughs> and, she said that, that, and she said that her payment, she would, he didn't pay her any, any, he didn't give her, pay her a fee. What he did was he gave her five copies of the print. And so she said, oh, I'm, and she put them in her, her closet and said, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to keep those. They're going to be worth something one of these days. So one of hers was the one that was at the Eric Carl? It was the one that her son owned, Hamilton, loaned to us, Hamilton, Missouri. That was beautiful. Um, you mentioned to big. Me, <laughs> it's yeah, huge. Yeah. You mentioned to me recently that an Oz Club member had uh, reviewed the exhibit or um, something. It was something that Grace Gluick did. Oh, Grace Gluick, yes. Yeah. Um, Grace Gluick, who is one of the the uh, you know one of the major uh, art ad, uh, art uh, reviewers at the Times, New York Times, Sunday, uh, Sunday edition. Um, I found in Fred's paper, papers, a letter from her back in the 1960s when she joined the Oz Club. So she had long been a fan of Oz. So this is one of the few exhibits at the Eric Carle that was actually, that was reviewed in the New York Times. And she, I think she spent her, she spent her, um, her summers up in the area, up in the Berkshires. So it, it was it wasn't difficult for her to come over and see the show. But uh, yeah, she's she's an old Oz fan. Now galleries and auction companies and even private collectors turn to you, I think, more than anyone else, to get original artwork, authenticated documents, authenticated signatures. Um, yeah. Any interesting stories you can tell us that have come out of some of those um, experiences? You've well, had? there's some there's some infamous forgeries that are out there. In fact, there is a uh, a drawing on the market now that's up for auction of Glinda, which was a headpiece from TikTok of Oz. Now it's a it's quite a, a good forgery because the original is in a private collection. And uh, the, the signature is wrong. The original was not signed and the signature is obviously a, a forgery of Neil's later uh, signature. And the same auction house has already sold uh, to other fakes. And uh, I, I don't know how, how we can stop them from doing this, but. Now, more legitimate houses, however, have called you and you said that's a forgery and they have not been auctioned. If well, I recently, um, I would say within the last couple of years, Bonhams contacted me and they thought they, they had original drawings for The Wizard of Oz and not a single one is, is real. They're all fakes. And that, that was hard to admit. But they also, I also saw a, a um, group email. It must have, been, it must have been during Christmas holidays. Someone said we... We have someone is interested in selling this first edition Wizard of Oz, uh, Father Goose, and Denzel's Night Before Christmas, and they sent me the uh, the inscriptions, and I immediately contacted them, said, "Don't lose this. Go pick them up because the Wizard of Oz was double signed by Baum and Denslow. It had a little sketch by Denslow. They also had I, Father Goose. I, I don't know if the Father Goose was double signed or not, but the Wizard of Oz was. And there are only two known copies that are double signed, the other ones at Harvard. And um, the Denslow's Night Before Christmas also had a wonderful inscription in it. And they also had a, had a signed uh, photo of Denslow, the famous one where you can see Father Goose in the background. So, it, you know, it was, you know, I, I told them, don't, don't let this slip out of your hands. You've got to get hold of these, you know, go over there now and have them consigned. And actually, I think, I think they got about a, uh, I don't know if it was 200,000 or something. I don't know what they cleared, but it was, it was certainly at least 150,000. So they're very happy with that sale. Tell us a little bit about your your perspective on Wicked and and how that's affected us. Well, of course, you know I I think 
it, it seems that The Wizard of Oz is, is Broadway proof. First, there was the 1902 musical that was a big success. Then there was The Wiz in the 1970s. That was a big success. And now Wicked, which is one of the most successful things in, on Broadway the last 20 years. And um, I remember when the book came out, uh, I saw that uh, um, that Gregory was giving a reading. So I went to the reading, I picked up top of the book and I waited in line and I gave it to him. He said, who's this for? And I said, this is for Michael Patrick. And he said, do you know him? <laughs> and I said, yes. And then he wrote in it to Michael Patrick Kern, who knows how really wicked this book is. And uh, uh, I guess a, a year or two later, um, I was speaking at Harvard and my hostess invited Gregory and we all had had lunch together and I got to know him very well and I've you know, stayed at his house and he, he, we often get together when he's in town and um, I, I'm, I'm very fond of Gregory. Where did his interest in theater originate? Um, I'm wondering if if that might have been an alternative career for him. Well, uh, his uncle, Adam Clark Baum, who later was his partner with the Baum's Castorine Company, was very involved in amateur theatricals in Syracuse. And um, a lot of Baum's you know, classmates, uh, you know, his, 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 his milieu, his group of, of friends, his posse, were uh, also involved in these productions. And Baum's aunt, Catherine, was an elocutionist and she taught drama and he was one of her star pupils. And he performed in a number of amateur theatricals in Syracuse and in central New York. And uh, he, he really got the bug and really wanted to become a, an actor. He was a little bored with chickens. So he, he decided he would become a, an actor. And he left for New York City and he, he worked with a well-known uh, theater coach and he got, a job in a, I was, I would say, third-rate touring company called the Sterling Comedy Company that was going through the coal and oil fields of Pennsylvania that summer, and he played what was called a walking gentleman, and this was like the second lead in, in a play. He never, he never played the lead. He never played the romantic lead. That was done by the guy who was managing the company, and he performed under the name of George Brooks, and the company you know, again, was not particularly successful. He's mentioned in a couple of reviews, not often, but his father was getting very involved in Richburg, New York, which was a boom town during the oil, uh, uh, you know, during the oil boom in Southern New York in the 1880s. And his father was going to bring in a railroad. He was going to do this and do that and be involved in, and, and really build up the community. And Baum wanted he, he, he saw that there was a need for an opera house. So he had his father build him an opera house, Baum's Opera House in Richburg, New York. It opened in December and burned down in March. In the meantime, L. Frank Baum had been writing plays and one of them called The Maid of Aaron. He decided to produce himself. He was backed by his father again and he put together this company and he premiered it in Syracuse, New York on May 15th, 1881. And this was on his birthday, his, 26th, his 25th birthday, I guess. No, 1882, his 26th birthday. And uh, then he went on the road. The first season was very successful. Then he went out again for, for another, uh, you know, for another, uh, on another tour around the Midwest and, and parts of New York. New York. Unfortunately, it was one of the severest winters of, uh, of, uh, of recent times. And being on, the, uh, being on the road was excruciating. And uh, it was very hard to pay, you know, to pay the company and bomb. You know, they were, they were constantly having problems with, with uh, actors quitting and then having to find new actors to replace them. And finally, uh, finally it failed in Richmond, Indiana. And Baum was ready to come home. There survives a letter that he wrote his father saying, I'm quitting the company. Can you please get me a job? And so he went back to Syracuse, got involved in um, producing Baum's Castorine. He had, all, he had married Maud Gage in the meantime. It was during the summer 
1882 that he and Maude were engaged. They got married that November and she went on the tour with him. They did not even have a honeymoon. He had, he had to get back to the company to, to continue the run. And, uh, you know, for, you know, for a few years, he, he lived in Syracuse. He continued doing some amateur theatricals, prim primarily with, I think it's a YMCA group, a uh, Catholic group. And so he, he wrote at least two plays, uh, uh, performed two plays, um, Made of Aaron around St. Patrick's Day and then Kilmorn. Unfortunately, the, the script for that does not seem to survive. And then he went to Aberdeen. He continued doing work in amateur theatricals. But I think I don't think he ever wanted to be an actor again, after a professional actor after the failing of Materan on the road. I think it was just it was just too tough a life for him. And uh, you know he he you know he continued appearing in amateur theatricals even when he was in Hollywood. He would write these little skits for the uplifters. You know this club within a club of the Los Angeles Athletic Club. And so, you know, I don't, I don't think he ever pursued being an actor after that. Although I have a suspicion that he, he that I, I think I've spotted him in, in, as an extra in some of the Oz Film Company productions. So, but he, he did go then from acting to, well, the musical, the 1902 yes. was Oz, mm -hmm. tremendous success, tried fairy logs after that, TikTok, Man of Oz, and then went into silent movies. So he continued to evolve sort of with different media. Um, no question about that. Yes, he, he was, he was looking for, constantly looking for new ways of, uh, of expressing himself. Uh, the Radio Place was primarily a promotional tour. It was very expensive to mount, mount because it had trick uh, films plus these hand colored hand colored trick films, those hand colored slides, and it was not a success. Uh, there is a letter that survives from him to um, a, a, an illustrator, the, and uh, he he wrote to her, "I've never seen that that small an audience in my life <laughs> about one of the performances in Chicago." And I think the real problem is no one knew what it was. I mean, if you heard something, let's go see the, the fairy log and radio plays. Huh? What's that? And even the reviewers didn't know exactly how to describe it. It was actually, uh, at the time, there, there were these very popular uh, uh, touring acts of uh, lecturers who would lecture on, on Japan or China or something like that. And they would have short films and slides to show. And Baum's son, Frank J. Baum, had done that at, at, you know, in, in various schools and, 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 ch and children's groups. And so Alfred Baum thought, well, why don't we go to Oz? So he rented the Selig Polyscope Studio, which was one of the earliest silent film studios in the country. And uh, he had these little trick films done. And then he, um, went on to, you know, then he, he had them hand colored and they were ex extremely expensive, but the return on the, on the tour was not helpful. One thing it, it did, it did prove to be a great promotion because Baum earned more that year from royalties than he ever did from any other, other year when he was working with Riley and Burton. 1908 was a big year for his royalties. The royalty questions reminding me of one that, um, came up, I was asked to ask about Baum and Dinslow and how their relationship um, ended. You talked about it in the annotated Wizard of Oz introduction, and I've never seen anyone discuss that unless they were drawing strictly from what you wrote there. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what was going on there with rights and royalties and concerns. Well, because Baum and Dinslow paid for the, the, the plates to have the plates made for Father Goose and the Wonderful Wizard of Oz, uh, they both jointly they jointly copyrighted the two books. And uh, when Paul Teachens proposed to L. Frank Baum to do a musical based upon the Wizard of Oz, Baum was reluctant because he knew that Denslow was certainly within his rights to act, ask for part of the royalty. And Baum was not, it, it did not have a very good relationship at the time. There, at least that's what he told Teachens. Now, all of this is in Teachens' diaries that were loaned to me by his daughter, um, 
And, uh, and so it was actually Denslow who proposed it. It was actually Teachens who proposed it to Denslow. And then Denslow took the project to various people he knew in the theater because he had, you know, through his, his years in, um, in, with the newspapers, he knew a lot of people in the theater business. Well, Baum and Teachens didn't really know, know many people. And the Schuberts looked at it at one point, but they turned it down. And the Schuberts, of course, came from Syracuse. So it's possible that Baum, that they were aware of who L. Frank Baum was from, from the 1880s. And then um, eventually they got um, Fred Hamlin to produce it. He, he, uh, Denzel knew his brother, Hamlin's brother, and got the manuscript to him. And he agreed to, to uh, produce it. And it turned out to be, you know, the wicked of its day. But the end of the Bomb Dinslow partnership, too. Yes, it had already been over before that. In 1901 was the last book that they worked on together, and that was Dot and Todd of Maryland. Uh, but the only way that Teachens and Baum were going to get the play produced once Hamlin <clears throat> had agreed was they had to give up part of their royalty to Denslow. So Baum and Teachens got the same uh, percentage, while Denslow got a smaller percentage. But it was enough to lease an island in Bermuda and declare himself king. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. But he had other he had other sources of income too. But Baum was earning about fifteen hundred dollars a week, and that was quite an enormous amount of money in those days. And the Baum's books did very well. He he could live comfortably off his children's books, but it was the musical that really made him a wealthy man. Um he when he moved into film and started the Oz Film Manufacturing Company, are there things about that company that are distinctive or unique in the industry at the time? Well, I mean, uh, Baum never did anything second rate. If he was going to do a, you know, a promotional tour, he was going to get these trick films and send them to France to be hand colored. Same thing with these slides. So the radio plays and uh, very long radio plays was enormously expensive to produce. When he went to Hollywood and got his friends at the athletic club to put up the money for the Oz Film Manufacturing Company in 1914, these were not gonna be just any films. These were going to be filmed musical extravaganzas. So they were very expensive to produce. Certainly Patch of a Girl of Oz, The Magic Look of Oz were very expensive to produce. They also had original scores written specifically for the films by Gottschalk, which was not that common in those days. And uh, it opened in, Patch of a Girl of Oz opened in, I think it was the Strand Theater in New York City. And it was, you know, it was, it was a movie palace. It wasn't just a Nickelodeon. So, it was, you know, and unfortunately, most of the patrons said, this is just a kiddie show. Why should we be paying full price? I think a pre full price movie ticket at that time was $1.50, which was a lot more than the Nickelodeons that, uh, you know, most people went to. It was just the beginning of the, the big productions in Hollywood, full length motion pictures. Uh, Birth of a Nation opened uh, a few months after the uh, first of the Oz films was released in 1915. Um, so, you know, it was a, it, Hollywood was changing at that time and Baum thought that he could, he could, you know, make a small fortune on, on the film industry. But, uh, unfortunately times were changing. Uh, World War I broke out in Europe. Uh, people were interested in other things than, than musical extravaganza. Uh, Charlie Chaplin was coming on the scene. Uh, Theda Berra appeared in her first picture as a vamp. Everything was changing and um, the adult entertainment was not the same as it had been um, before that. So the, the company closed after, after four productions. But there had been some individuals involved with it who went on to uh, important careers in film. Well, I want to correct one thing. L. Frank Baum never directed any of the films. They were all directed by J. Farrell McDonald, who later on became a well-known um, character actor. In fact, he was part of John, John Ford's um, company. He, you can find him in some little role in almost all of John Ford's pictures. Um, one of his biggest roles was in Susanna the Mountie. He's the old guy looking after Shirley Temple in that film. But you find him 
you know, he's in Topper, he's in uh, oh, so many famous pictures, just usually playing a cop or, uh, you know, typical Irishman. And uh, I mean, he appeared in a lot of James Cagney pictures. You can, you can see him every so often in all, all these films. But in, at the time, a director had his own, had his own company. Extras would move with the directors. He went from one studio to another. Um, uh, J. Farrell MacDonald had just directed, I think, a, a film of Samson. And he took his extras with them and among them, were two, two very well-known Hollywood people, Harold Lloyd and Hal Roach. And while they were working on The Patchwork Girl of Oz, Hal Roach had inherited some money and he said, this looks easy. Let's start our own film company. And the first person he hired was, was Harold Lloyd. Now Lloyd almost had an earlier connection to Oz when he was, when he was just starting out, look at, he wanted to become an actor. He was either gonna be an actor or a prize fighter, but he decided to become an actor. And he saw on uh, he saw an ad for chorus boys for the TikTok Man of Oz, but he didn't have the courage to go in and and apply. But later on, he had he had worked with J. Farrell McDonald. I think it was at Universal where they made the Samson, and then he he went over with him to do uh, uh, to work with the Oz Film Company. And Hal Roach, I think he's called Al Roach, plays either the Carly Lion or the Hungry Tiger in that film. Of course, you wouldn't recognize him. He's, you know, in an animal costume. But Hal Roach later became a member of the Uplifters, and he produced uh, a revival of uh, Uplift of Lucifer, this little skit that the bomb had done for the Uplifters. And uh, a friend of mine was doing a biography with Hal Roach, or working on his autobiography. And I said, well, would you please ask him if he remembers anything about the Uplifters? And Roach told him, well, you know, you, you know, the symbol of the, the raised hand. Well, he said, you know, that that really meant uplifting a glass of beer or booze <laughs> because they obviously were still very involved. You know, they were there. It was a convinced you know, a, a social club. And even during prohibition, the uplifters long after bomb had died, uh, uh, built a clubhouse that was uh, hidden away from, uh, from prohibition. They even had, a, I think, a special bar that they could then turn over. And then if, if they were raided, they, no one would find the, the alcohol that was there. But yeah, he, he said that was as much uplifting, it referred as much to uplifting a glass of booze as it was to uplifting society. What were some other hobbies that L. Frank Baum had? Oh, where to begin? Uh, well, everyone knows that he was known as the Chrysanthemum King of Southern California. Uh, when he settled in Hollywood, he bought a double lot. And uh, on one lot, he built his house. And the other was his, his garden. Now, Maude Ma said in a letter, I think this is a letter to Jack Snow, that before L. Frank Baum went to Southern California, he didn't know the difference between a, a a chrysanthemum or a begonia or something like that. It was her mother who really had a wonderful garden back in Fayetteville. Of course, Baum grew up on Rose Lawn, which was famous for all its, its rose bushes. So he was certainly aware of, uh, you know, of, of the beauty of a, of a garden. But uh, he, he would, he would um, enter th these, his flowers in various uh, competitions in Southern California. And his friend H. M. Haldeman, who was one of the founders of the Uplifters with him, would enter the professional, uh, um, the professional um, competition while L. Frank Baum would do the amateur. And uh, they had a, a rivalry, rivalry going on between the two of them. Who was the better, who, was the, who, was the, who, who grew the better flowers? He was an avid photographer most of his life, wasn't he? Well, I, I, he, he started photographing in the late 1880s. Uh, he was an amateur photographer. Um, and it's, there are quite a few photographs survived that he took of his own family in the 1880s, 1890s. And I, my suspicion, I think, I think there's enough evidence to show that the early issues of uh, the show window were photographed by L. Frank Baum himself. In fact, he gives advice to how you should photograph a show window 
so, so you don't get the glare on the windows. He talks about that in the magazine. And most of those early pictures are from are of Chicago store windows. Later on, the various um, you know, uh, designers would send in photographs to the magazine. But I think those early issues are probably photographs that Baum took himself. Oh, and you know, he you know, he was basically an amateur photographer and through much of his life. And quite a few photographs do survive that evidently he took. Um, talk a little bit about his politics. Oh God, his politics. I don't think he really had any politics, any, any, anything consistent. Uh, there's a famous story in the family. This is what his uh, sister-in-law told is that in 1896, when he was on the road selling crockery, he, he was asked by a friend of his if he would speak at a local, I guess it was a Republican meeting. So Baum went there and he, he gave this fiery speech on, on uh, we, have to, we have to defeat the Democrats, the Republican party must win, blah, 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 blah. Then somebody else asked him, unbeknownst to the, the first guy that Baum would speak at a Democratic uh, meeting. And he agreed to do that. And he gave the exact same speech but he did not realize until he was looking at the audience that the first guy, the Republican who had asked him to speak was sitting in the front row glaring at him. And uh, he, he really, I, I, you know, he, he, I think he voted traditionally Republican. He was a, he was a member of you know, Abraham Lincoln's party. And he also was a supporter of Teddy Roosevelt. Matilda Gage told me, Matilda Jewel Gage told me that the niece that um, Baum, <laughs> that Baum had a lot of opinions. And once he stated his opinion, that was it. There was no arguing with him. You know, he just would just state that. But I don't think there was any consistency in his beliefs. If he voted regularly, it would probably be Republican. For that, for at that time, that was the progressive party in the country. Um, he was against American intervention in World War I and got in a lot of trouble because of that. Both he and Maud did because um, uh, L. Frank Baum evidently said something that offended people at, the upl at an uplifters meeting, and he was accused of being unpatriotic. So he composed an open letter to the members of the uplifters saying that, that his family had fought in the revolution, in the civil war, and that his son was now engaged in, in the conflict in, in Europe and that he, he, was, he could show himself as being as patriotic as anybody else there, even though he did not feel that Americans should be involved in Europe's wars at that time. Also, Maude had, <laughs> Maude belonged to the Hollywood Women's Club and to the local DAR, and at one of the meetings, they had each of the women stand up and talk about you know, the, you know the, the wives of the French, wives of the English, she stood up and defended the wives of the Germans, which did not sit well with many of the people, many of the women in that group. Matilda happened to be there. Matilda Jewel Gage happened to attend that. She said it was quite a scandal. Um, you mentioned to me the other day it, it, that Baum expressed them philosophy, basically, in a letter he wrote Robert. Um, could you maybe tell this group a bit about what you told me about that? Do you want me to read from it? Well, sure. Well, this is a letter that uh, in it happens uh, August. Happens right there. <laughs> what? It just happened happen to have it right, right here, there. yeah. <laughs> August, this was in August 1910. It was a letter from L. Frank Baum to his son, Robert S. Baum, his second son, who was very frustrated with with his 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 work, uh, his future, his future, uh, and th this this quite a long letter, a very heartfelt letter to his son. My private opinion, evolved through considerable experience, is that the world is a theater for various comedies, and whoever makes a tragedy of his play is looking at life cross-eyed. You'll notice the tragedies don't draw while the comedies do. You can make yourself and others very unhappy over tragedies, but the crowd will move away and you'll have yourself in your loneliness. But if you take a knock down with a laugh and jump up smiling, a thousand, a thousand people will laugh with you and put you on the put you on, on back. The trouble is that some folks take the world too seriously. It looks big and black and dangerous to them and gives them heart throbs. 
Really, the world is a hard nut to crack under such circumstances. The wise ones won't be bluffed. They see that the millionaire, the sod carrier, and the engineer are all the same clay, and no one has a corner on prosperity. The other fellow, whether he rides in an automobile or a streetcar, has no advantage over me nor I over him, unless it be in mental caliber. If I excel in this, I can beat him to the goal, for my outlook is more calm, more comprehensive, more intelligent. Therein lies the one point of superiority one entity may claim over another. The world of the world may leave the rich man poor and the poor man rich, as old Bill of Avon, William Shakespeare says, each man in life plays many parts, and they're not all star parts either. The good actor takes what comes and smiles. Did you ever see a ballet dancer whirl on her toes till they must hurt her like the deuce? but face the audience with a dreamy, if set smile. She knows the smile is essential and perhaps saves her from hoots of derision. I don't care how much a fellow is down and on his luck. If he is cheerful, if he has cheerful cuss and good company, I like him. If he's gloomy, I shy away. So basically he was saying, you know, you have, you know, this, this is his philosophy. He, he really was like Mr. Micawber. He was always looking for something to come up. He failed so many times, but he was so optimistic that something else would happen, that he eventually he would be able to support his family and, and become a wealthy man. And it wasn't until he started doing children's books that he really found his true calling. And this is what he was telling his son. Really, you know, you've, you've got to take things, you've got to be positive or you, you, can't, you can't defeat yourself before you've even, you've even tried. Do you, thanks for reading that. Do you think he understood that his life's work as an author was going to, in the words of one of his obituaries, live immortal as long as childhood lasts? How well, I think, he, I think he knew his position. He knew his books were popular. He knew he was doing something original. That um, he, did, he did talk to his publishers or write to his publishers that he hoped there would be a uniform edition of the Oz books eventually of all his books uh, called Bomb's Fairy Tales. And, um, you know, he, he even bound at least two sets, rebound two sets, and he, he had them in blue, leather, in, in blue marble boards and leather and had them stamped in gold on the spine, Bomb's Fairy Tales, and then with the title. Um, so he, he, was, he was pretty sure that he, he, he believed that he was doing something original and that it would last. There's no question about it when he died, which was relatively young, tell us a little bit about how his family um, and publishers continued his legacy. Uh, during World War I, the Oz books were, fell, fell down in sales. Scarecrow of Oz was probably the least successful of all his books because it came out in 1915. But by 19, uh, 1918, when the Tin Woodman of Oz came out, there was a huge boom and it was enormously successful. Magic of Oz, Blend of Oz were very successful. And Baum had originally intended that his book for 1921 would be uh, Animal Fairy Tales in a collection. And Maud, you know, contacted Riley and, and Lee and asked him, you know, when is it coming out? And Riley gave her a very flimsy excuse saying, well, you know, we can't afford re-illustrating it and the illustrations that are in the magazines is delinear, it was serialized in the linear. He said that um, uh, they, they're, just not, they're just not clear enough for reproduction. So we, we really don't want to do that, but we would like to continue the Oz series. Glinda of Oz was so successful and, and the last three books were so successful, they couldn't let Oz die without him. And they had contacted John Arneal even before Baum died, to see if he would continue the series. I don't know what happened there, but of course he didn't at that point. And uh, they were looking for somebody to do it. And William F. Lee, who was uh, uh, William F. Lee of Riley and Lee, he lived in Philadelphia and he was very fond of the children's page in the public ledger. And that was almost entirely written by Ruth Plumley Thompson, who was on staff. And he contacted her and asked her if she would like to continue the series. And she was flattered. She said she had grown up on the Oz books. She's very fond of them. And they asked if she would 
submit a manuscript. I don't think she had an actual contract at that point. I think it was it was on spec. And she sent in the Royal Book of Oz. She said she reread several of the, the Oz books and got an idea and decided to, and, and wrote, wrote the manuscript. At first they wanted to pay her a flat fee. And she said, no, she wanted a royalty. So they worked out with Maud Baum that they would have the right to publish any additions to the series. And I think it said they had to be once a year that, that Riley and Lee had to issue a new Oz book once a year. And Ruth Pumley Thompson got 10% and and the bomb and, and Maud Baum as Baum's widow got 5%. It was about 15 cents a copy. So Ruth got 10 cents a copy and Maud got five cents. So um, it, it worked out. Uh, although Ruth, I, there are many letters from her to Riley and Lee saying, I want a contract, I want a contract, I want a contract. And they finally gave her one. I, I think she had already written maybe six of the books before she finally got a contract from them. But um, but that was how they were able to continue the series. Now, when Ruth decided not to do continue writing or Oz books in 1939, uh, the obvious person would have been John Arneal because he had read all the books that he illustrated. It was a you know it was a daunting test to find somebody who knew Oz as well as as John Arneal did. So they hired him to continue the series. He didn't know until uh, it was about. It was about Easter. He didn't even know that there was not going to be another Oz book. He wrote to Ruth asking, where's, where's the Oz book for this year? And she wrote back that she was retiring. And that's when Riley and, and Lee contacted him. So he didn't have a lot of time to write a new Oz book. So while he was illustrating the manuscript, he had done a, a first draft. He sent it into Riley and Lee. It wasn't really publishable. They sent it out to a ghost writer who rewrote it. Without his, without his knowledge or his permission. He, was, he did all the illustrations, sent them in, and there was this hybrid book called The Wonder City of Oz, published in 1940. He was so upset that he, I, I think he may have told them that he wasn't going to do another one, unless it was the way that he wrote it. The other two books were issued pretty much as he wrote them. The manuscripts survive, and they don't vary greatly from the, the published book. Um, so, you know, for uh, Scalawagons of Oz and Lucky and Bucky and Oz, they're pretty much what he wrote. Mm -hmm. But then World War II broke out. Um, John O'Neill died. Riley and Lee did not know what to do. They had a manuscript called Runaway, A Runaway in Oz by John O'Neill, but he hadn't finished the illustrations. They didn't know what to do. It wasn't until after the, they were able to talk to Maud saying, well, because of paper shortages or whatever, we're waiting until the end of the war to continue the series. And they were rather desperate trying to find somebody mm -hmm. to write the books. And they asked this guy, Jack Snow, who was talking about writing a bomb biography. He never wrote a word of it. And uh, he, you know, he was, he, he, everyone thought of him as the expert on Oz. He had never read the Thompson books, but they, but, but Frank O'Donnell, who was the successor to Frank Riley, asked him if he would continue the series. So the, the first book that he wrote, uh, uh, Magical Mimics and Oz, came out in 1946, I believe. And then they waited a couple of years and Shaggy Man of Oz came out in 1949. And there was no argument from Maud. Uh, then a, a book they they wanted Snow to continue writing. He had an accident and he lost his job. He had a really rough time, and uh, they lost communication with him. And so they were a bit desperate. They felt, well, you know, we have this contract. We have to fulfill it. Then this manuscript came in called Rocket Ship to Oz, that uh, by an unknown writer, Rachel Cosgrove, and they liked it enough. But they asked for certain changes and it was published as the hidden valley of oz but by the time that came out um pretty soon after that maude died so their contract was now null and void riley and lee did not have to write have, have to continue the series if they didn't want to and uh they only published one more book uh, uh, well they did publish uh, who's who in oz which was sort of a summary of those first uh, first Oz books. And then years later, they published Merry Go Round in Oz because they wanted a book from Eloise Jarvis McGraw, who was very popular with the librarians. 
and the new editor there it was now the company was now owned by Henry Regnery. They wanted to revive the Riling Lee children's books, and they thought Mary Mary Garand and Oz would do that. In the meantime, Ruth Wally Thompson had written her twentieth Oz book, uh, Yankee and Oz, and had submitted it to Riley and Lee, and they turned it down. And she was furious. She was she was livid that they would they would not have shown her the respect that the, for one of their major writers. And uh, she withdrew it. And uh, <clears throat> Mother Mary Garoud and Oz was published. It was not successful. It was not particularly popular. Henry Regnery continued the series for a while. He left all, he let all the books except for the bomb books go be remaindered and out of print. And uh, it was years later that Fred Meyer asked Ruth Olmey Thompson if the club could publish Yankee and Oz. And she was very happy. She was, she was having a really rough time at that time. She had been writing a column for Jack and Jill that had been, uh, that, you know, had, 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 had been uh, canceled. She also was trying to do other work as well, but Yankee and Oz came just in time. And I'm pretty sure Fred paid her an advance on it mm -hmm. and paid for the publication of it because he wanted it. And then, then, well, this is a side note, but um, when my first job out of <laughs> out of uh, college was working for Cricket Magazine, children's magazine. It was just founded, and I, I worked there on the second volume of it and, and for several years. And I contacted Ruth and said, I, "I understand you wrote a book called The Enchanted Island that was never published. Um, do you still have that manuscript?" And she said, "Yes, she did." And I, I said, well, is it possible you would submit it to Cricket and we'd be interested in serializing it? And she said she was. I haven't to mention it to Fred. So what Fred did was he jumped in there and said, Ruth, would you rewrite it as a Nas book? And we will publish it by the club. So I never even had a chance to see the manuscript or submit it to Cricket. So that was how Enchanted Island. She said, sure, I'll rework it for you. And that was her final publication. Um, Maud took over responding to fan mail for a while, <laughs> royalty yeah. renewals. You were telling me a little bit about the um, situation with the royalties when the Chadwick film came out. That's a little complicated, but let me start with uh, what happened exactly after Baum died. Maud was the uh, sole beneficiary of his estate. And the first year, I think it was the year, well, uh, Magic of Oz came out after Baum died, then Glinda of Oz was published posthumously as well. And Maud continued to answer Baum's correspondence, but it, you know she'd write answers in her hand and then she had a rubber stamp of Baum's signature. So from about 1919 to 19, early 1921, there are these supposed letters from L. Frank Baum from Beyond the Grave. They were actually written by Maud Baum using, and using his signature. I guess she did not want to spoil, uh, upset children that L. Frank Baum may have been dead. But when Ruth Plumley Thompson became the Royal Historian of Oz um, with um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the Royal Book of Oz in 1921, she took over the correspondence rallyingly after that forwarded everything, even the letters addressed to L. Frank Baum to Ruth, and she would answer them. Uh, but what's also funny is that, well, you know, when Royal Book of Oz was published, there, it was under the pretense that Ruth had worked with some notes that L. Frank Baum had left, and she just expanded it. Now, Ruth was quite adamant many years later that she wrote it entirely on her own. L. Frank Baum, it, it, she had nothing. L. Frank Baum left no notes that uh, she used in writing that book. So it, it seemed to be a hybrid, but it's not. It's total Ruth Bonley Thompson. So was Maude negotiating, was she the contact person when the film rights were being sought for things like the Meglin Kitty film and the Chadwick film and finally the MGM film? Well, in the 1920s, uh, Maude turned over the responsibility for licensing her books to her oldest son, Frank Jocelyn Baum. And uh, he was a, he he had been trained as a lawyer, and she thought you know he he could handle those rights better than she could, so she turned it over to him. And in nineteen, it must have been nineteen twenty four, Frank J was 
peddling The Wizard of Oz around these very studios. The only one who bid on it was Chadwick Studios, which was just being formed. Uh, Larry Seaman, who had been a very successful comedian, wanted his own film company, his own production company, like Harold Lloyd, like Buster Keaton, like Charlie Chaplin. And he thought he would make it big with The Wizard of Oz. He thought that that would make him, uh, it would establish him as an important slapstick comedian in the tradition of, of Keaton, Chaplin, and, and Lloyd. Well, I suspect everybody here has seen the 1925 film. Mm -hmm. So you know how bad it is. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it, it really was used. <laughs> <laughs> some people laughing yes i agree with you that uh yeah it really was pretty bad and it, it was just a way of showcasing his ability and it was a dismal failure a box office failure and it led you know it's now considered to have led to his his early death a few years a couple of years later be, because of uh it, it was it was such a blow to his 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 ego and he, he died not long afterwards Maud did attend the premiere of the MGM film. Yes, yes. Well, she appeared uh, and she spoke outside over the radio, but it was a prepared statement from MGM. Mm -hmm. And that survives in one of the family scrapbooks, the actual transcription. I think it's, all, it's in her hand, but there's also a type version too. So I think she just copied it over so she could it easier for her to read if it was in her own hand. But yes, yeah, she she did speak. But uh, and the, uh, the funny thing, this is what the, this is what Ozma told me uh, that Maude was invited to the premiere, but instead of bringing anybody from the family, she took her boarder, and the family was outside, cheering on. And as Maude was going by, she snubbed them, and then after the movie was over, they passed by her and snubbed her in return. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how The Wizard of Oz happens to be known around the world? Oh, well, I don't know where to begin, but I, I suspect most of you people know this from John's work that the 1939 film opened just as World War II was breaking out. And so they lost a lot of the European market. They lost Germany, they lost Italy. Uh, they also lost uh, the Asian market, Japanese as well. When it was opened in England, it was considered for adults only. They thought the Wicked Witch was too scary. So they lost that, you know, that market as well. And it wasn't until 1949 when it had general release around the world that it really made back its money. But it wasn't until the film was shown on TV in 1956 and then uh, uh, repeated 19. 1956, in 1956, and repeated in 1959, and then every year after that, that it really became a staple in an American, you know, American childhood. But it was also re-released uh, abroad. But what really made a difference was when it was a DVD. It was shown in, uh, it wasn't shown in Russia until the 1970s. I think it may have been shown on TV. But by, by, coincidence, the first translation of The Wizard of Oz in Russian came out in 1939, but the MGM film had nothing to do with that. And the book went through two, it went through two printings. It, it generated maybe one review in all, you know, all the Soviet Union, one review. But the book was so popular with children that even though they couldn't get it, they would hand copy it and and exchange it, you know, and, and distribute it that way until the 1950s, late 1950s, when the translator Volkov uh, reworked it, put all, it was at the height of the Cold War, so it was full, he added all this, this Soviet propaganda to the book. The first edition is a pretty straightforward translation, except for a few incidents that Volkov added to it. But by the late 1950s, uh, there really was this, this push to, you know, basically to, I mean, Dorothy lives in such poverty because of the American economic system. It's, you know, it's pretty clear in there exactly why there are all these, uh, um, uh, why all these horrible things happen to her because of the capitalism, uh, Western capitalism. So, so the book was available in Russian, um, I believe in French in the 1930s. 
no 20s. The first edition appeared in French in the 1920s. Uh, also at that time, 1920s, of all things, Glinda Vaz, and I know um, Queen Zixi of Esk, I think was published in Dutch. It was first serialized in a magazine, probably they took it from St. Nicholas, and then it was published in a, uh, a single volume. I think Cindy Ragney discovered this. Um, but Land of Oz and The Wizard of Oz were published in French in the 1920s. And then by the 1930s, a few other editions came out. I think there's a Brazilian edition in the, in the early 30s. Uh, but by 1939, there were, Bob's Merrill arranged to have a Swedish, I'm trying to think how many, I don't know how many other editions there were, but several editions were a Dutch, several were issued that year. And then it wasn't until after the war, probably in conjunction with the, the international re-release of The Wizard of Oz in 1949. Aha, here's a Volkov. Someone's holding up a Volkov right now. And, uh, and, and the book was almost immediately absorbed into these class these series of classic children's books from around the world so the wizard of oz was popping up in in this translation that translation also the volkov book was also translated in the communist bloc countries for example in china they it was the volkov edition that they translated not not l frank Baum's book so kids were getting to know the story around the world without necessarily understanding that that there was an mgm musical out there they knew no no i don't think mgm musical had that much of a influence until it was a dvd in terms of uh, the international and the other thing is when volkov published the wizard of oz or the wizard of the city of emeralds in uh, the soviet union in 1939 bomb's name is not on the cover or on the title page mm. it's alexander volkov a volkov tell me tell us why you think Baum named Dorothy Dorothy? Uh, it was a pretty common name at the time. He knew he knew several Dorothys. I mean, Harrison Roundtree, who was Chauncey Williams' brother-in-law, and Williams was Baum's first publisher. He published Mother Goose in Prose. Baum became a good friend of his. Um, uh, his daughter was named Dorothy, Dorothy Roundtree, and he was very fond of her. Uh, he also wrote a uh, his first use of Dorothy was in Mother Goose and Prose. The last story is about a little girl named Dorothy. Now, in 1898, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Gages, uh, T.C. Gage and uh, Sophie Gage, who were Matilda jo uh, Jewel Gage's parents, had a daughter, and they named her Dorothy. They also had a daughter named Alice, who had died. Then they had a daughter named Dorothy, who also died. And um, it was just at the time Baum was writing The Wizard of Oz. Maude was very fond of that little baby. She wrote a wonderful letter to her, to her sister-in-law, how much she missed her and how much she, you know, she said she could have been her own. And of course, Maude had no daughters of her own. So she felt particularly close to this little baby named Dorothy. And uh, Sally told me that when she was interviewing Matilda at one point. Matilda asked her to turn off the, the tape player and she did. And, and Matilda said that she always felt or always believed that Baum had named Dorothy after her dead sister as a, as a tribute to Maud. Mm -hmm. And of course the book is dedicated to Maud. Have any recent discoveries in your research that you uh, can tell us about? Oh. I don't know. I don't know where to begin. <laughs> uh, All my questions are too broad. I'm sorry. Have you discovered any artwork that has been previously unpublished recently relative to us? Well, I did find I did find two Denslow drawings of Scarecrow, Tin Woman, Currently Lying that have never been published since 1904, I think it was. Um, I'm trying to think well, what else I've seen. Um, well, I, I suspect most people here have seen the American Road, you know, American Antiques Roadshow, where someone bought a copy of The Wizard of Oz, the one that he gave to Dorothy Roundtree, and there is a sketch in it of the scarecrow, and uh, and and a cat who who looks like a ringmaster, and that was because Dorothy Roundtree was was head of a of a um, a fan club dedicated to cats. It was a some sort of a cat breeders, cat fans or something like that. But she was, uh, that, that, ob that obviously was a reference to uh, her, her love of cats. 
Um, I'm trying to think what else. I don't know if anyone know. I don't know if many people here know that L. Frank Baum's father knew the assassin of. Oh, what was this? Which which president was it? Um, he, Garfield. He, was it Garfield? Lincoln, maybe. He, he was he was murdered in a train station. It wasn't Lincoln. It wasn't Lincoln. It wasn't McKinley. Maybe it was Garfield. Garf Garfield. Yeah, Garfield then. Yeah. Yeah. He evidently knew him when uh, he was he knew he knew the family. The family were in um, um, Oneida, the Oneida community. And when Guito, I think Guito was his name, assassinated Garfield. Benjamin Baum was interviewed by a local paper and it was published all over the place. He was interviewed about the family and he said, yes, he did know them. He thought they were strange. <laughs> <laughs> they were communists, you know, and at, at that time it was not a particularly uh, uh, admirable uh, philosophy. One of the questions that had come in was, if there was anything that was really surprising that you'd learned about Baum or that was surprising to you or that might be surprising to us. And well, that was certainly one of them. <laughs> Yeah, that was a surprise to me, certainly, that B.W. Baum knew the assassin, the assassin of, of Garfield. Um, what were some of Baum's favorite books to read? Not his own writing, but what were some of his what books did he read? Well, I was I was talking to Bob, or oh, emailing back and forth to Bob Baum recently, and he had sent me a picture of Baum's library. And there's a picture of a writer on the bookcase. And I suddenly recognized who it was. It's Andrew Lang. And uh, L. Frank Baum evidently was a fan of the color fairy books, the blue fairy book, the red fairy book, the yellow fairy book, all, all those famous English collections. And uh, I know that Frank J mentioned somewhere that he remembered the Andrew Lang books being around uh, around the uh, uh, you know in you know around Baum's library around the house when he was growing up. And he also had you can also see there uh, Baum owned two Gustav Gustav Doré editions of. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and the Raven by Poe. And you can see the, the Raven is also in that picture on, on, on the bookshelf. Mm. But you know, Baum owned a lot of books I don't think he read. For example, he, he bought these, uh, these sets, for example, F, you know, um, Sir Walter Scott. Uh, I, I happen to have the, the set that he has that was owned by Baum by Frank Stockton. And it's about eight volumes and only two are cut. So it's pretty clear that Baum did not read all these, these books that were on his shelves. Did he have favorites of his own books? Well, when he died, shortly before he died, he wrote Riley in Britain. This is when he was talking about, he wanted his, his work to be collected in a uniform volume, like these sets, like the Frank Stockton and the Sir Walter Scott. And he mentioned he thought The Wizard of Oz was his most enduring work, but he also liked Sky Island. Those were the two books he pointed out. But of course, you know, every year he wrote, there's Sky Island, every year he wrote a, you know, he wrote a book, he said, this is my favorite. Uh, there's, there was a famous tagline with when the Scarecrow of Oz came out, and it said, my favorite, L. Frank Baum. Well, if you look in the correspondence, it actually was Maud who said it was his best book, not L. Frank Baum. Although the publishers, you know, claimed that it was. What about you? What are your favorites of Baum's books? Well, of course, The Wizard of Oz is fantastic. I love Sky Island, you know, Queen Zixi, um, Ozma of Oz. I have to say when I was a kid, I was particularly fond of the magic of Oz because you have this anti-hero. Kiki mm -hmm. R.U. is this awful kid who comes out of nowhere and causes so much trouble. I thought that was such an extraordinary idea to have uh, you know, a, a kid who's really a villain from the beginning of the book. And I, I have to say that that was one of the one of my favorite favorites of them. It may not hold up as well now as it did when I was, you know, 10 years old, but uh, 
Yep, there's the magic of Oz. Um, Rinkitink and Oz that was a, a novel, not an Oz book, and then became an Oz book by changing the ending. What from your research might you be able to tell us about how that might have originally? Uh, I, 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 have, I, have no, I have no idea. But if you read the novel, you know that he reworked the first chapter as well as the, as the final chapters because he, he refers to Professor Wogglebug's map that was published in TikTok. The manuscript was probably written in 1905. It probably was going to be the next book after Queen Zixi of X, but his publisher wanted another Oz book. So he, he published Ozma of Oz. Uh, no, John Doe and the Cherub. And maybe, oh, maybe it was, well, it's mentioned as early as 1905. But for some reason, he put it aside. Maybe he had problems with the ending. And so he, he wasn't ready to publish it. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We just know that there was this manuscript called King Rinkatink that he mentions as early as 1905. And then we know that he re rewrote the ending. Um, but there's nothing, no indication in any of his correspondence what was going on here, you know. What he might have done with the original ending to work it. Yes. Well, he always kept two manuscripts in his vault so that should he die, mom would at least have a couple more books to publish posthumously. And King Rinkatink was one of them. But in 19, 1915, Baum was, he was not in good health. The Oz Film Company had just failed. Uh, he was having problems writing what became Lost Princess of Oz. So he pulled out the manuscript of Rinkatink and reworked it as an Oz book. And but we don't we really don't know what, what that ending is. It is a possibility he wasn't happy with the original ending. Mm -hmm. But it is if if you read the book and stop where before Dorothy and the wizard suddenly come in, it is quite a tantalizing. There's, you know, you really do wonder what could have happened had they not butt in. Um, and what about your projects? What are you working on these days? There's a lot of paper behind you. Uh, yes, well, this is Ed, an annotated Edgar Allan Poe, very complex book that I'm working on. I also just did a, an afterword for uh, The Art of Oz by Gabriel Gale that's gonna be published by Rizzoli this fall. Um, what else? Um, you know, it's just, you know, I'm doing a piece for the New York Times on Al Saley, you know, this would be his hundredth anniversary, so I proposed doing a little piece on him about you know what it was like taking his course back in you know back at back at Hamilton. None of us have read Gabriel Gale's book yet. What? Tell us a little bit about what that what we can expect from his Art of Oz. Well, have you seen oh. the Chronicles of Oz that he's written? Yes, he, he wrote and illustrated. <laughs> well, this 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 is background material. He's he's a trained architect. And um, he approached Oz almost like a scientist, you know, he, like a biologist. And he's done these extraordinary, he did this extraordinary uh, preliminary drawings, uh, paintings for all these different Oz characters that fascinated him. And they've been pulled together in this, this anthology. It's gonna be a coffee table book, sort of like, the gnomes of Oz, I guess you could call it, and uh, it's, it's it's quite extraordinary. I mean, he really is 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 uh, a brilliant artist. Yeah. Um, somebody just now noted in the chat. They asked what you thought of Return to Oz, the Disney live action film. Well, that was disappointing, as we all know. Uh, when it was in production. Uh, Walter Murch and Gil Dennis, who wrote the screenplay, contacted me and, and gave me a copy of it and asked me to read it for them. They wanted my feedback. And the thing that the major problem I had with it is, is it had almost no humor. It took Baum's fantasy and turned it into this horror show. And I, I, I protested that they wanted to give Dorothy shock treatment. I thought, that this, what, what are they thinking here? This is completely out of, uh, it's certainly not part of the Oz books. And I, I was invited to the premiere. Of course, they ignored me, but th they invited me to the premiere. And I could see the kids in the audience literally squirm during that 
section where Dorothy's being threatened with shock therapy. Uh, and pretty soon, you know when kids are not interested when they start making noise and, 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 and fighting and that they, they, were not, they were not enjoying this movie. And I, I think the real problem was that it, it lacks a sense of humor, but Walter Murch doesn't really have a sense of humor. You know, I mean, I, I think he's a very gifted edit, editor. He's done some brilliant work, but um, this was just not the project for him. I, it, it was a big disappointment. Although I think Feruza Balk was brilliant. I thought she was wonderful, but it was such a downer, you know. One of my favorite things about it is Jack Pumpkinhead, who I just thought was Neil's illustration coming to life in front of me. And I like I liked TikTok too, but you know, so much has to do with tone if you look at the 1939 film, yeah, there is a lot of that slapstick vaudeville uh, routines with Scarecrow Tin Woman, Cardi Lyon, with Bolger, Lar, and, and Haley. But it, it works because it it's it's silly, it, it's not Oz, but th there is a sense of humor there. There was none of that in uh, Return to Oz. And the other problem I had with it is that it had, it was a schizophrenic film. I mean, the combination of live action, puppets, claymation, didn't all fuse together. I mean, it, it, I think it was trying too many technical things without looking at what is it, 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 it really lacked a heart, a real center. You know, I, I think Feruza Balk really was a very, yeah, you know, I thought she was a delightful Dorothy, but you know, it was it was just too terrifying. You know, I I don't think Baum thought in those terms. I mean, he, he was it was a satirist. He was not a, a terrorist. <laughs> when you mentioned silly, um, I immediately thought of the Meglin film. Have you seen the Meglin Kitty's Land of Oz? Yes, not I, 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 the one. It's it was missing the the. Um, a soundtrack in the first reel. Yeah, that Walt Willard has a, has a print of it. And I did see it at one of the Oz conventions. And, you know, it's, you know. I think of it as- It, it, it ain't no MGM. With lots of somersaults and cartwheels and- Well, it was, it was showing off the Meglin Kitties, which was a, um, uh, it was a school for budding Hollywood kid actors. Judy Garland was in some of their films. Shirley Temple started out as Meglin Kitty. I'm sure there's, I think Darla from The Little Rascals was also one of them. There were, you know, that that was, she she really filled in uh, the, the, you know, kids in Hollywood, you know, a lot yeah. of them. Would that have been at a time when would, they would have had to have gotten the rights to make the film of Land from Maud? From oh, yes, they did. They got, they got, they got the rights, yeah. And then the, the Eschbach film that followed that, um, that might even have Frank Jay's name on it. Well, Frank Jay is given credit for the screenplay as he was with the Larry Seaman 1925 Wizard of Oz, but I don't know, I really don't know what his involvement was. He was representing Maud at the time and he sold the rights uh, to the cartoon. He, he had also contacted MGM. He tried to get them to do a series of cartoons cartoons based upon the Oz books. Unfortunately, they contacted all these librarians who said that they would not, these books would, these cartoons would not appeal to adults. So they turned it down. Mm. Little, little did they know they ended up buying the rights to the Wizard of Oz for a lot more money a few years later, buying it from Sam Goldwyn. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what else to ask you and checking real quick to see if anybody else has popped anything. Someone asked about your interview with Gloria Gottschalk, what was that like? Oh, um, um, she was delightful. I mean, she had a long history in Hollywood. She worked for Hal Roach for many years. Uh, her father had been, uh, had written uh, scores for not just the Oz Film Company, but he also wrote for Broken Blossoms for Dieter Griffith and Orphans of the Storm. He wrote for uh, Douglas Fairbanks, uh, Three Musketeers, and I think also Robin Hood. He had a, you know, he, he, he was very well respected as a uh, composer in Los Angeles. Uh, and, you know, she filled me in on all of that. She had some photos that she, she copied for me. She did tell me that 
Oh, she did remember Bob vividly. He was very close to the family. She was very fond of him. And he told her at one time that uh, he would he would use her in one of his books, her name in one of his books. And she said to me, well, I have, you know, I guess he never did. And I said, well, yes, he did. And I sent her a copy of The Scarecrow of Oz. And I said, here you are. Here you are, Gloria. You were, you were named Princess Gloria in this book. It was named after you. And of course, Bomb dedicate TikTok of Oz to God's Chalk. She obviously saw the, the Oz films. She remembered seeing them on a great big sheet in the in the backyard. And she oh, I think she also told me that she remembered these little woozy toys that they were not unable to uh, distribute properly or to sell. And she remembered they used it as kindling wood. Yeah, they were, you know, they had boxes of them and they just threw them in the fire, you know, in, to get start, a fire started, cold nights in Los Angeles. Oh, it happens and we should make Sarah unmute and tell us that that little woozy toy and how that film was marketed is a upcoming feature story in the next Bomb Bugle. There oh. are only a couple of them that I know that have survived. I've seen one in the box. Ooh, who had that? It's oh. still in the family. It's still in the family. I know Bob Bonds. But they pretty much disappeared. I mean, they, they were not successful. And uh, I think Bob, uh, Bob Bomb told me or his father told me that they also used them as kindling wood. It, it was actually manufactured by Violet Macmillan's husband. And he, 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 he founded this Oz toy company. And but he bowed out, he, he sold his rights back to Baum and then the residue were taken over by Rob Baum and he wasn't able to sell them either. And he took them to Joliet, Illinois where his, his wife's family had a, had a department store but he wasn't able to distribute them either. They did, really didn't know what to do with them except Re as firewood. Researching for this article of the Bugle, Nate was finding um, all kinds of promotion for the Patchwork Girl of Oz around Los Angeles with live in-person appearances by the Patchwork Girl and the Woozy and they- And the Patchwork that. Girl was a man. <laughs> <laughs> they pr promoted that film really heavily. Really, I'm looking for- Well, like not, not, not really. It wasn't, no, it wasn't that heavy. Paramount took it, but we're not happy with it. And uh, they dropped it fairly quickly, and they didn't. They didn't want the other Oz films because they the film was not that successful. Yeah, I think most of those promotions were probably done by the Oz Film Company itself to try to drum up some interest. Eventually, okay. Violet McMullen, who played Ojo in the film, and she played Dorothy in another film, um, she went on. She went back into uh, vaudeville, and she did this skit about. What, what was like working in the movies. And since this was right after she had finished the Oz Film Company contract, uh, she must have been, it must have been mostly about her, her, her days as uh, Dorothy Ojo. <laughs> um, Ray had asked in advance what advice you thought Baum might be giving to modern writers and, and storytellers today. And in the margin here, he's expanded that a little bit to ask what you what you think Bomb would think of the fan fiction and television and graphic novels and all of these various types of adaptations of his Well, work. he would have been he would have been happy had he gotten a royalty from them, of course. But uh, fan fiction goes as far back as Ozma Boss. I, I gave uh, uh, Sarah uh, something that appeared in Syracuse newspaper that she published in the Bugle. As far as I know, that's the earliest example. of of fan fiction, but there often were these writing contests and kids would write their own little Oz stories uh, in these various newspapers over the years, or they write little poems, that sort of thing inspired by Oz. Um, you know, I, I, I have to say, I don't know. I, I, think, he, he, I think he was very uh, controlling of his own rights after, he was very upset with Denslow that Denslow went on to do Scarecrow and Tin Man, both the picture book and the comic page, when he had just published The Marvelous Land of Oz and was doing his own comic page. And uh, he said that after that, he would not allow, he would not share his, his uh, copyright with any of his illustrators. John O'Neill was paid a flat fee, but 
he did arrange to get a penny a book. So that's how we know how many Oz books were sold a year, which titles based upon his royalty statements. Yeah. Um, suddenly I'm getting lots of questions, one of which is uh, Baum's various pin names and where they came from. Oh, well, one thing I found out recently, Sam Steele, you know, Sam Steele's Adventures, that was one of his, his, his uh, uh, teenage fiction. There was a, uh, a traveling salesman with Pitkin and Brooks, the company that Baum worked for, named Sam Steele. And he evidently was very one of the major, uh, you know, one of the, one of the major salesmen for that company. He died suddenly, and uh, I've come across his obituary. Evidently, he was very well liked on the road, and Baum obviously knew this guy and used his name later on. Hmm. Wasn't one of them after an uncle? Was oh no, name? yeah, yeah, uh, Skyler Stanton was named after an uncle. And I found out things about him too. He eventually was sent to an insane asylum and he died a long time before uh, Baum used his, his name. Of course, he spelled Stanton differently, S-T-A-U-N-T-O-N -T rather than S-T-A-N-T-O-N, but he, he was uh, his mother's brother. Yeah. So the rest of them, he just made up, Boyd Akers and Laura Bangor. Well, Suzanne Metcalf was actually made up by by um 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 by britain he oh. came up with it but there was a singer a well-known opera singer named suzanne metcalf spelled differently but same name mm -hmm. uh, edith van dyne there were some van dynes in syracuse that, that were friends of the family he may have taken that surname from them mm -hmm. um f acres of course is fakers so you know obviously a pun uh, Fitzgerald, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. It's possible that Riley and Lee came up with it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think. Um, Bancroft. And, well, Laura Bancroft is, of course, Lyman Baum. I mean, L, you know, LB, you know. But I don't, I don't know of any person in particular that may have been named after. But there is a, a presentation copy where he said from uh, from the author with a great big L for Laura Ly Lyman and then a great big B for Baum, for ba Bancroft and Baum. So he obviously wanted something with the same initials. Hmm. Well, we've probably exhausted you and time, but um, other things you wanted to share that we haven't covered? I mean, I realize you could talk about <laughs> Baum for the rest of the week, yeah. Well, is there anything else any of the any any of uh, our colleagues would like to ask? Yeah, we had um, some really broad questions that you and I discussed earlier that we were afraid would, you know, take uh, time eaters probably yeah, would, would take the whole thing. But one might be uh, bi biographical aspects of his life that you think are not well known and should be things that will you know, that you'll be able to write about that maybe have not been previously written about by someone? Well, a lot of it, you know, a lot of it's based upon, you know, the interviews I had with Matilda, mm -hmm. with other members of the family. Um, I mean, one story I've told many times I got from, from Dorothy uh, Webb, Dorothy Haldeman Webb, is that she remembered, she, she, I guess she heard it from her father that, you know, the bombs and the Haldemans used to get together and in, in, in Hollywood and at once a week and play cards. And one day Frank was regaling them with some 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 wild story. And uh and and the Haldemans asked Maud if that was really true. And she said, Well, you know how Frank makes his living. <laughs> Writing fairy tales is what she was indicating. And um, you know, other other little little stories like that. Um I'm finding things in letters like this thing to Robert Baum that there are there are some very revealing things. But you know, I've, I've I came across recently little items in the provincial press about Baum when he was on the road with Pitkin and Brooks talking about Frank Baum is back in town. He's staying at the such and such hotel or boarding house, and he's regaling the uh, the other um, the the other people with. Uh, 
singing songs at the piano and things like that. You know, so he was, he, he, you know, he was a, you know, very, very well liked and that he was even mentioned in these little newspapers. Obviously he made some sort of impact while he was on the, on the road selling crockery of all things. Did he play the piano himself? Evidently, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Um, I know that Rob, uh, the whole, the, the four bomb boys were all taught to play instruments because I think it was primarily, it was Gage's influence, Matilda Gage's influence, because should anything happen to Baum, they thought that maybe these the kids would be able to earn a living by performing in an orchestra. Uh, I know that Gage mentions that she hopes that Frank J will one day, he could play the organ or the piano in a church and be able to support himself. And this was from, you know, Gage, who was not a, a, a believer. Yeah. So. Um, somebody typed in, did Bob, did Bob ever lose his temper? Was he ever angry about things or was he a pretty even tempered guy? No, Matilda re remembered one instance. Uh, well, actually yeah, one instance that uh, he got, lost his temper with her. This was at Makatawa. And uh, he, he had his, his writing room above, uh, uh, above the living room you know, the floor above it. And uh, one day Matilda came with some of her friends, some of the young people, probably with Rob, Rob's friends. She stayed there uh, one, one summer at Makatawa, the whole summer. And they started playing some Bomb's records. And later on, he got, she said he got very angry with her for playing, playing these records. He said that, that, uh, she couldn't understand them. So uh, my suspicion, my suspicion is Baum was a big Wagnerian and she may have played something like the Libestrud from, 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 um, uh, um, oh, and Isolde, what is that? Uh, Tristan and Isolde, which was a very sexual piece of music. They may have had a, a recording of and thought that this was inappropriate for, for teenage girls to be listening to. Did, are there any recordings of his voice? Not that I know of, no, no. I, 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 I haven't seen or heard or found any reference to him. I mean, he was ham enough that he probably would be very, ha ha very happy to uh, record his voice, but I have not, not heard anything. And I don't know. Anything. I don't remember if you told me tonight or recently that you looked at his films to see if maybe he did a walk on anywhere in the background. Yeah, there are a couple of places. I recognize that nose, the bomb nose, <laughs> in in some of them. Even though he's he's got he's made up or he's in in the background someplace, I, I have a suspicion I, I I I I can recognize him in in some of the films. You've been kind of instrumental in finding. Well, I was I, I identified the Wizard of Oz, the 1910 Selig that was at George Eastman House. They sent it down to the Museum of Modern Art for me to take a look at it and. And you know, I, I verified it for them. That MoMA had a had a print of the last Egyptian, and uh, I made arrangements with uh, what's his name? He was a wonderful curator there, uh, and he he showed it to me, and uh, and it, it it was incomplete. And also, I think his name was Charles Silver. Yes, it was Charles Silver. Exactly, I'd known him from the early 70s. In fact, he had shown me the other Oz films that he, he was able to he get, get them. And I also saw them at, at the Library of Congress. And uh, it was missing the first and last reel. And because they had been hand tinted, they were in such a bad state that they oxidized. And then they were used in a film called Dicasia, uh, which is a, a wonderful avant-garde film. And, and you can see a couple shots of taken from this this uh, ruined film, but we did show it at the Oz convention uh, one year. I was wasn't able to arrange it with Charles Silver to uh, le let us uh, let us see it. I don't think it's, it's never been on DVD. I don't know if they they will put it on anything like that because it's in such bad shape. I mean, it's uh, you really have to. No, you certainly have to know the plot to figure it out. But there, you know, I think because of the uh, hand coloring, there's a lot of oxi oxidization of the film. Um, Sarah asked if 
anyone who talked to you about him in interviews even described or characterized his voice or his mannerisms. Um, oh, wow. Well. I've seen in the newspapers how, how they talk about how handsome he was. And, uh, you know, when, when he was in Maid of Aaron, he was going all over the country. So there were a lot of, of descriptions of, of how, what, what a good actor he was or what a bad actor he was, depending upon who was reviewing the film, but they, they, the show. Uh, but he evidently made quite an impression with uh, uh, wherever, wherever he performed. And it was what the Maid of Aaron was the only time he was ever in Kansas, I believe. Well, he could have been there at some other point, but that's the only recorded time he went to Kansas. And that was, uh, yeah, Ma did not like Kansas at all. She wrote a rather uh, <laughs> negative letter back to her family in Aberdeen. Wasn't she pregnant at the time? And it was that miserable winter. I don't think, I don't know if she was pregnant at that point. I don't know. It was right. It was soon after. Well, I think I think it was very early on her part of the tour after she got married. I think it may have been in Kansas, may have been an introduction to Kansas and also to the very tough uh, life on the road. You know, they were they were doing one night stands in these little, you know, podunk towns by then. Um, somebody asked about the dreamer of Oz and. I don't know that most people realize that you were kind of instrumental in the original initiation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it it's not a happy experience. Um, I knew a young producer, film producer, and uh, he won. We were working on some various ideas, and you know, I was working on the biography, and we put together a treatment of the life of L. Frank Baum, and he took it to David Kushner, who had just produced who had been involved with American Tale. I don't think he was a producer on it. I think he wrote the screenplay. Somehow it was his concept. And he's very, he was very, he wanted to move into television. And he was a big Oz fan, turned out he was a big Oz fan. And uh, he bought the treatment, never gave us credit for that. And uh, we had a falling out over, over the script because, uh, I mean, he. You know, he basically bought the rights to my book and did whatever he wanted to. So, you know, it was not, it was not a happy experience. You had said, had you been at the premiere, you would have skipped all the celebrities and taken Maude aside to interview her. Well, you that was that. Yeah, that the the premise of the of the film came from me. The idea that uh, that there's this young kid who's being uh, interviewed who who interviews Maude. She's being ignored, which was, of course wasn't exactly true. She's being ignored, and he he says, "I wrote this college paper, which obviously was me because I had written annotated Wizard of Oz when I was in college." That they added. I didn't. I didn't. That that wasn't part of it, but it was based upon my fantasy. If there was anything, I really would have liked would have been possibility of interviewing her, and so I put that in the in the in the treatment, and I just found that that she had been at the premiere and what she had said at the premiere, although they didn't use that in the film, they changed it. And uh, the young man who plays me is, oh, Hegwig and the, and, and the, oh. John, John Cameron Mitchell. Yes, John Cameron Mitchell, who later did Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which seemed ironic. So I was actually played by Hedwig in that film. <laughs> And if you look, there is a there before he t stops Maude, you get a brief glimpse of a young man smoking a cigarette, and that's David Brooks, who was the producer that I worked on, who 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 wrote the uh, the uh, treatment with me. Yeah, I am mentioned, but if you blink, you no way you can see it. It goes by so quickly. And here I thought your only on-screen appearance was in some soap opera that you did a walk on. Or what? <laughs> oh yeah, I was I was in soap opera, but no, I've been in other things as well. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, yeah. But that wasn't me. But it was being I was being played. That really was was my character. Um, uh, at least that was the what I invented, and uh, it was played by that that actor. Yeah, you've talked to me about 
your kind of research, which we discussed early on and throughout this versus internet research, maybe we could combine Ray's question about advice for fiction writers with your advice for researchers where the internet's concerned. Well, as you know, you can't believe everything that's on the internet. You have to be <laughs> very cautious of what, what's printed there. There's so much yeah. little stuff. You have, to, you have to really dig around and find some source of, uh, you know, where, do, where does this come from? I mean, you've known this, David, and your research, the same thing. It's just absurd, some of the things that are published without any basis, in fact. You know, it's... It's very frustrating, uh, and trying to trying to correct that is almost impossible. Once, the, once the, the early Wikipedia entry claiming that Baum spent his last years in a bird cage in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, no. He he. Remember, L. Frank Baum took morphine and wrote the last Oz books in a bird cage. I mean, I, I could see that see it now. I'm talking to Maud at breakfast. Hey, Maud, get past the morphine. I'm going off to the birdcage to write a new Wells book. Glinda of Oz was posthumous. Did the publishers change the manuscript after Baum's death? No, they're just they're just a there are a few changes. The manuscript survives and it's almost identical to the published version, oh. except for a few few details. Right. It's all in his handwriting. It's right there in the Library of Congress to let you handle it. Yes, and it was it was a gift of the Baum family, basically the memory of Ozma in in um, what was it nineteen ninety nine two thousand yeah two thousand before they did the centenary exhibit there. Well, I was involved in it. Ozma died in nineteen ninety nine, and we had to. I had spoken to her about it before, and she liked the idea of it going to the Library of Congress, and the family, you know, did give it give it uh I, that was really janet's decision uh because it was owned by jointly by janet and osma and they gave it to the uh the library of congress there aren't many other manuscripts that survived um didn't the tin man manuscript survive and and magic okay and where are they they're at uh university of texas except for one chapter is in yale um mod 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 Someone had a fan had written her and they want a manuscript and she sent a chapter from Tim Woodman. And then later on, another fan wrote her and she sent the, the rest of the manuscript to him. And that was sold in, I think, the late 1960s and ended up at tech in Texas. And then the Baum family, uh, Robert's family, uh, had the well, had, had uh, Magic of Oz and the. <laughs> That was saved from Maud's bonfire in the backyard. And, and my suspicion is, I mean, everyone knows about this famous story about how one day Maud was in the backyard burning the manuscripts and someone called up Rob Baum to say, look at your, your mother is, is destroying all of your father's papers. You better get over there. So Rob and Edna went over to to stop Maud, to see what, what was going on. And, and Maud is there putting all this paper into the incinerator in the backyard. And, and Edna is elbowing Rob, your mother, your mother's getting rid of his papers. And so he, he spoke up and said, mother, can I have one? Okay. And she gave him the magic of Oz. And Edna didn't understand why he didn't say, can I have all of it? You know, if you're going to burn it, why do I take all of it? But my suspicion is that probably Tin Woodman, Magic of Oz, and Glinda survived because they were the last ones in the series, and probably they had been sent back to Maud. And uh, it, I, I don't, we don't know what else was was among those papers. We do know that probably was Baum's correspondence. But one thing people don't know is Baum's legal papers were retained mm. oh. so all his contracts and all of that it, they were retained by his lawyer all right michael so totally different question when are we going to get to read the great michael patrick hearn l frank baum biography you when never ask a writer when he's going <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a fish and oh. first 
And then I have this whole book. Um, I'm still working. I, you know, I'm still working on it. I'm still writing it. And every so often, I sit down and start working on another chapter. So it's it's in the works. Well, back to those contracts. Where are they now? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm okay. not sure. I had access to them through the family, but I do not know. I do not know specifically. But so my question is, uh, Michael, where might there be pockets of information on Baum still? Do you think that, for example, Aberdeen has still some secrets of his life there? But Nancy Copel has been doing a lot of work. Um, she just retired from the South Dakota archives, but uh, she's done a lot of work on, on Baum and his days in South Dakota. Uh, she really knows more than anybody else. And uh, I don't know if she has something planned or, uh, you know, but she may she may be doing something with that too. I mean, she she located uh, uh, the only known copy of the Western Investor, which was a, a financial may, uh, journal that Baum issued in, while he was in Aberdeen. So, you know, she may have found some other things as well. well I, oh, think, yeah. I think Jane uh, wants to wants to wrap this up. Trying to so. wrap this up and thank my oh. and. Um, Hopefully we can do it again someday and maybe we'll have a more tight topic so I won't take up quite so much of your time. That's okay. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye all. Right. Bye all. See you Jane. Oh, I love these mute mo <laughs> <these> mm -hmm. <laughs> clapping. <laughs> thank you all. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Bye.